Good evening, everyone. My name is Derek Olson, the president of World Oregon, and we're thrilled to have you join us here tonight with a program we're starting in just a couple minutes with Tom Goldman, NPR sports correspondent, who I'm sure many of you have heard but haven't seen in person, and so I'm sure you'll enjoy tonight's program. Uh, a few just brief announcements before we launch into the discussion. Uh, first of all, um, a huge thanks to all of you. Um, you received a special invitation for tonight's program for your support over this very challenging year of 2020 uh, through your membership, either joining or renewing your membership, donating, uh, you know, serving on the board, just really helping us to um, uh, do what we do to connect Oregonians with the world, even amidst this very challenging situation uh, for all of us. So a, a huge thank you. Uh, on, on, from the whole team for your generous support of our work. We hope you enjoyed tonight's program. Before we dive into that, I'm gonna highlight a couple of the other programs that are coming up very soon. First of all, this Friday is our second uh, of eight talks in the Great Decision Spirit series that uh, my colleague, Tim DeRoche is uh, uh, curating and we're excited about that. If you haven't had a chance, you can buy a series ticket on our website. Um, that'll be Friday at noon on Zoom. Uh, if you know teachers in the uh, uh, in your immediate vicinity, we are teaching or holding a series of, of training for teachers on culturally relevant teaching. We had a session earlier today on that, and we have one coming up in February, so it's for teachers. And then our big news is, is that Thursday we will be launching the sales of the International Speaker Series. We're thrilled about the lineup that we have. Um, Stay tuned Thursday for the lineup and your opportunity to buy tickets. As always, there'll be a discount for members. So if your membership is lapsing, renew your membership and you'll get that special discount code. And now without further ado, uh, we're thrilled to have uh, Tom Goldman, the NPR sports correspondent, who many of you may not realize lives here in Portland. And so not only has a world of view of sports, but also a really a local connection. And we uh, thought that it would be fun to talk about a topic that is hopefully a little lighter than some of the most heavy that we've been doing about COVID and that's the Olympics. But I should note, and Tom will get into this, there's a lot of tough questions going on about whether it should happen and what, what it should be like because of the persistence of the pandemic. So Tom is gonna to say a few opening words um, and then we're gonna have a discussion. We'd encourage you to early on to post your questions in the Q&A where Tim, uh, our program director, Tim DeRoche, will monitor those. And Tim and I will be raising questions to Tom because we'd really like to involve you as much as possible in this discussion. A big thanks too to all of you who are OPB supporters for being uh, in the audience today as well. We love our partnership with OPB. Without further ado, I'm gonna pass the floor to Tom. And after he says a few words, we're gonna dive into conversation. Eric, thanks. And uh, hi everyone, thanks for joining. Uh, today, tonight, um, for as uh, Derek said, what we hoped would be a little lighter conversation. Normally, um, I would be looking forward to going to, I believe it's now my 13th Olympic Games in Tokyo in 2021, um, the rescheduled um, Olympic Games. And um, athletes are gearing up for it as well. It's always um, an exciting and um, um, really amazing um, event. Uh, and, and all the things that Olympic organizers tell you about the world coming together and um, it, it feeling like a big world festival. There are moments when it really is, that really is true. Um, there's, you know, a lot about it, the, the business side, the money side that, you know, isn't, isn't as enjoyable as, as just the sports, but when you get right down to the athletes, um, it's really fantastic. You, you see and, and meet a lot of athletes from places, um, from all over the globe. And for them, it, it really is as, as big a deal, um, as it's made up to be. Um, but as Derek also said, um, we're facing some realities um, that last year's postponement um, in late March of the 2020 games um, may be repeated. And um, so this is uh, a little disconcerting to all involved. Thanks, Tom. And we look forward to getting into discussion about the Olympics, maybe talking uh, a little bit about comparison to some of the other sports that have tried to uh, resume uh, in the pandemic times. 
um, and, uh, and also some of the other factors at play. Um, we were just talking a little bit before uh, about this, that there's sort of a split, it sounds like, between some of the discussions in um, uh, you know, what some of the Olympic authorities are saying and then what some of the other uh, authorities in Japan have somewhat equivocated on whether or not this will happen. Maybe Tommy could talk a little bit about more about some of the back and forth about, you know, will, the, will these Olympics actually go? Yeah. Um, well, at this point, we absolutely don't know. And, and no one in the Japanese government, no one in um, Olympic circles really knows. And, and, but you do have a growing number of people who are speculating that um, it, it may not happen. You know, we are still in the teeth of a rampaging pandemic. Um, vaccinations are beginning, but um, you know, we don't know how quickly this will happen across the world. And certainly I think the consensus is that vaccinations um, won't, won't be administered on a worldwide basis, certainly by the time July rolls around when, when the games are scheduled to begin. Um, you are hearing from um, Japanese officials at this point and International Olympic Committee officials that the show is going on and yes, there's been a surge and a declaration of an emergency in Japan and Tokyo and, and, and surrounding prefectures um, uh, because of the surge in, in COVID cases, but they say, you know, we're still months off and this will go forward. And as I said to you, Derek, I believe, you know, that organizers are, will say that and, and be optimistic. That's what they're paid to be um, up until the moment they cancel. Uh, but that moment isn't coming now. It may not come next month. It may come in March when, when you know, a decision has to be made. Um, also, at the same time, you have two recent polls of um, the Japanese public and around 80%, 80% say they don't want these games to go forward. They want them either postponed or canceled. Olympic officials do say there can't be another postponement. If, if they don't, um, if, if it's just untenable and they can't do this, they're going to have to cancel. Mm. And it would be an Olympics that would be canceled. The only other cancellations, three other cancellations, only happened because of world wars. So that would be a dramatic thing. Um, for a lot of athletes, it would be disappointing. You know, these athletes don't have a shelf life like you see a lot of athletes in professional sports. Some can go for 10, 15 years. For some athletes, they have one Olympiad, one four-year period where they gear up and, and, and that's it. And so uh, it would be a huge disappointment for a lot of them. So. Yeah. Is that because the Winter Olympics are scheduled to take place in China in 2022, or is it just with all the TV contracts and everything, it's just too hard to 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 reschedule uh, yet again? Yeah, I think I think it is. It's just it it's just kind of when you kick this can down the road even more, you're just getting into, you know, as you mentioned, you've got the uh, the Winter Games in February of 2022. Um, I mean, if the if the summer games go off, that's going to be an incredible turnaround just six months later. And then you've got um, men's World Cup soccer uh, at the end of 2022. Yes, you've got lots of contracts. Tokyo has already paid billions of dollars um, for the delay. Um, the, the the most recent figure I, I saw was uh, the costs have risen to about 25 to 28 billion dollars. Wow. And a good chunk of, of that is because you're having to push things off for another year. That's expensive to do to keep venues, you know, um, uh, you know, running and, sure. and ready to go. So um, it's a huge cost. And, and the, the, the schedule, the way the Olympics go now, every two years, um, it's just, uh, it's pretty untenable right now. Yeah. So thinking optimistically, if they do happen, uh, what are uh, some of the lessons maybe that, that the, the Olympic officials might have learned from some of the other sports out there, whether we're talking in the US or with, you know, we've had different variations of the bubble. Uh, we've had the Premier League in England, lots of different approaches to it. I mean, do you, 
do you know are they are they modeling after or is it just just its own kind of unique event because of just the sheer numbers i think the latter derek because you know you do have um experiences certainly the nba bubble um even outside of a bubble you had major league baseball and um, the National Football League, which seems to be, it, it will get to the end and we'll have a Super Bowl in a couple of weeks. Baseball got through basically, um, but the sheer numbers, I mean, you know, you are dealing with 15,000 athletes and from all, I think it's 205 countries, um, many of them having different levels of, of COVID difficulties. Right. Um, you have officials, you have journalists, and um, it, it's just absolutely overwhelming to think of um, what you can do to prevent this from being the the mother of all super spreader events right. um and if they go ahead i i hate to be a downer here we're supposed to be we're supposed to be positive <laughs> but if they go ahead it's going to be very uh a very different olympics you know sure. it's, it's it's unsure at this point if they can even have have fans and that's right. a huge part of this whole global event is bringing people in and yes, making money from them, but also connecting them. And it, and it is this beautiful 17 days where, where you do make connections. Uh, for athletes, it's uh, meeting other athletes um, uh, from around the world. And, you know, they're, you know, what I'm hearing is, is that their movements will be very restricted. They're not going to be able to tour around Tokyo, even within the athlete's village. Uh, which is famous for athletes uh, connecting, and I mean that literally. <laughs> uh, in in many ways, you know, that's that's out, you know, and so and even for journalists, if we um, are able to go, we're looking at severe restrictions, and that that kind of makes it unfortunate for us. I mean, the beauty is to be able to go around, get to know the the the, the city the the country where it's being held, the culture, et cetera. But if we're told to go to an Olympic venue, then go back to your hotel, that's gonna greatly change the experience. Right, I mean, we were talking before the program, it seems I mean, one of the unique things about the Olympics is this, it's international competition, but through peaceful means. Yeah. Uh, and with a venue and the interaction between the different athletes is so much more part of the whole ambiance than say, you know, World Series or the NBA playoffs or something like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the the we all watch on TV and watch um, the athletic competition, but being an Olympics is so much more than that. Exactly. If you go to an NBA Finals or a World Series, you know, interacting with other fans isn't part of the experience. At the Olympics, it it truly is. It truly is, and that's why. You know, putting on, you know, being being half full here, if I or all the way full, if if they can pull this off, um, and and they they would be touting it as the, you know, this great coming together at a time when the world needs a coming together more than anything, and this would be the you know the coming out party, and that's the way they're trying to trying to spin this right now, yeah. um, if, if it could happen, it, it would be fairly remarkable, you know, yeah. but, but it doesn't look like their hopes that it would symbolize the end of the pandemic. Um, I don't think that's going to hold at this point. Yeah, sadly, because of the pace of vaccine distribution, yeah. that may not hold right. up. We're starting to get some good questions coming in from uh, the audience and keep them coming in the Q&A function. Uh, one of the questions is, you know, or do you know of any uh, local athletes and maybe either local or maybe they train with like, you know, Nike or Adidas who have significant uh, uh, programs here uh, that we should keep an eye on if some of the games are held. Um, you know, um, I have to admit, uh, Derek, at this point, um, I haven't uh, done my due diligence because right. I've been so busy with pandemic and every other sport that's going on. And it is a it's a daily job, really. You know, is the NBA going to fold up sure. today? Whatever. Uh, so, no, I don't. Um, I, I, I do believe Mariel Zagunas, the, the great fencer who's won multiple golds, I think think she is coming back. If you're on this Zoom call, Meryl, I, I apologize if, you're, <laughs> if I'm wrong. Um, but um, I'm trying to think Ashton Eaton, the great decathlete. I think Ashton may have 
retired after his great success. I believe you're right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that brings up a related question then, are they holding like national trials again? Or are they going with the results from last year? Well, no, they, you know, that's still on. And those are, you know, we, I was just talking to my editor the other day about that. We've got the main ones, swimming, track and field, which is scheduled for a remarkable Hayward Field. If you haven't been to Eugene to see Hayward Field, it's, it's, it's literally jaw dropping to see right. what they've done. Um, so the track and field trials, the swimming trials, uh, gymnastics trials, those are kind of the marquee events. Those are still on and, uh, you know, the, they have to happen um, because in a lot of these sports, um, that's how you choose your Olympic team. You have to, you have, to have trials. Um, I spoke to one athlete today, and as a matter of fact, an, a weightlifter who, who doesn't, um, she participates in a sport where you don't have a trials that determine who's going to go. You have different qualification events um, throughout the year or the, the year before leading up to an Olympics. So, um, so yeah, that, that's still the plan. And athletes are, are you know, pushing ahead. They're very aware of, of the concerns. And matter of fact, the athlete I just, I just mentioned, um, a weightlifter, um, 22 years old. She said that uh, she she knows what people are saying. She's uh, trying not to dive too deeply into the internet to to hear how bleak it is, and she's just going ahead with uh, with preparing because sure. that's all they can do right. at this point. And the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee has not said stand down. So right. everything full speed ahead until we find out really what's going to happen. Sure. I got a question uh, about you know Japan and, and and the role in the Olympics, and you sort of addressed this before, but uh, I mean, in contrast to some of the more recent hosts, like you know with um, uh, Brazil, uh, you know, and others who really want to use this sort of as a you know make a major statement on the world stage. I mean, what is what was Japan hoping to do? I mean, I know you refer to the the Olympics coming up two years later in, in, in China. I mean, there's some of that sort of East Asia competition, but was there some other kind of uh, message really that the Japanese were, were wanting to put out there as part of the hosting of the event? That's a really good question, Derek. And I think um, it's, it's really um, um, an interesting distinction when it comes to hosting, as you mentioned. I remember in Beijing in 2008, getting into conversations with um, just citizens riding mass transit. And I remember this one young woman who, who said, how are we doing? And she was so passionate about it. They, China is one of those countries. Russia was the same way um, in uh, 2014. Um, you know, th they want to put this great face forward. I think Japan, Japan um, is, is, a, is a stable country that doesn't necessarily need to put that great face out there. I think of uh, the 2012 London Olympics. London didn't need to tell anyone how great London is, and I think Tokyo um, feels the same way. Although, um, I, I that said, I will say that, that Tokyo, um, uh, it was very important for Tokyo to show how Japan has recovered from the Fukushima nuclear uh, event in, uh, in 2011. So there was that part of it. But as far as is our society functioning, are we doing a good job? I don't think Japan needs to tell the world that. I think it you know, it wants to put on a good show because sure. you are going to be the center of the world for 17 days. And, you know, the, the, it, a lot of it is a chamber of commerce kind of thing. You know, they'll, they'll show a lot of beautiful scenes of Japan. Hopefully that'll increase tourism. And there is that element that you and I spoke about that Japan, especially now would talk about a cancellation. Um, Japan doesn't want to lose face. This is another element to it. They don't want to lose right. face. China being China being the first post pandemic Olympics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We talked, you referred a little bit to the cost earlier and obviously Japan is a wealthy industrialized nation, but still if they were able to hold it and then they have, I presumably been able to cash the TV revenue checks, but not have some of the other associated say ticket sales and other marketing or, or, or swag and, and things, is that enough? just the TV rights alone for, for Japan to come out kind of, or the, the Japanese, I, I should say the organizing committee to come out okay, or are they gonna really be in the hole because 
because it'd be such a modified Olympics. I don't know, um, you know, the the percentage of of what they would lose by not having um, fans come in. There's there's a lot of money to be lost. There's already a lot of money that's been spent, and I don't know how Japan figures on recouping that. Uh, for the International Olympic Committee, TV rights and sponsorship are are critical, and so that's I think one of the reasons that the IOC is pushing so hard for this. Um, canceling an, an Olympics at this point, um, you, you do take a big hit um, financially. Yeah. So it's hard to have any discussion nowadays without, you know, um, recognizing that we're in, you know, a unique moment in American time and history. Obviously, there's a change of uh, administration tomorrow. Uh, we had the recent uh, mob insurrection where a former U.S. athlete, uh, you know, swimmer, I believe, was part of that insurrection. And so one of our um, audience members questions, you know, like, you know, everybody hears the stories and success and the weedy box, but I mean, uh, you know, is it challenging for some of these athletes to, to have, a, you know, a post Olympic life when you've been so much of their, uh, I guess, motivation and time has been spent around, like you said, one focused uh, sort of four, four year period event. I mean, it seems like that must be very challenging to, to then adjust to a, a more sort of normal quote unquote life. Sure it is. Sure it is. And you have to go no further than perhaps the greatest Olympian ever, Michael Phelps. Um, you know, if you've watched TV, he's doing public service announcements for, for mental health. Right. And um, that, that's a big deal. That is a big deal. And I think it's, um, it may be unique to Olympians in that there, there has to be such single-minded focus. And you were focusing on one little, I always think of figure skaters, but you could, you could say about any, any Olympian, you know, building and building and building to that one moment. That yeah. is a very kind of stressful pursuit. And, um, you know, I mentioned the, the young woman I was talking to, uh, talking to today about, um, uh, about uh, you know, the weightlifter and about whether, how she's dealing with the talk of postponing. And I said, well, look, you're 22. Um, you know, the 20, 24 games in Paris are coming up. You'll still be young enough, right, as, as a weightlifter. And she says, yeah, but that's down the road. I'm not thinking about that. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about this. But what she's also thinking about, she said, is that if um, if this games if these games don't happen, um, I have to be okay with that, and mm. I have to be okay and not think that all of my self worth is tied up into that. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's a constant juggling action that that I think a lot of Olympian a lot of athletes go through. You know, once the cheers die, that kind of thing. But especially for Olympians who a lot of them toil in obscurity until that moment um, right. when the lights go on at the games. So, yeah, I mean, I guess because it's one thing for a professional soccer player to join the Olympics for one or an NBA player to join it, but they can always go back to their pro league. But, you know, even for the glamorous sports of, in, uh, you know, of, of uh, like swimming or track and field. I mean, they're the rest of the year for a lot of, uh, you know, casual fans, they're kind of off the radar screen, aren't they? Completely off the radar. And that's why I love Olympic athletes. People have asked me, I've been doing this job for over 20 years. They say, who are your favorite athletes? I say Olympic athletes. One of the reasons is they all know what who NPR is. That helps a lot, <laughs> and because they're they're educated people and they have to live real lives. These are not athletes who are coddled from day one, like you see in in some some of our other sports. These are people who um, you know have to work a job while they're following their athletic pursuits. So they have to be grounded in reality. We've had some very famous Olympians like a Michael Phelps or, you know, take your pick, a Carl Lewis, on and on and on. But I, and this is probably unfair of me, I don't consider them classic Olympians. They're more like almost professional athletes um, because they are so well known and they get all the attention. I think of Olympians as the ones you never hear of. And maybe, you know, once the games come around and they compete, you don't hear about them. They don't win a gold medal, but, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of thousands of them. And, um, but they make it and, and they do well. And, and they're always kind of doing it, um, you know, um, w without being recognized. And, and sure. I, I find that very dramatic.
Well, along that lines, uh, there's a understand there's a couple sports that are new to the Olympics that are being introduced if, if they take place this summer that are, again, sort of uh, newer to sort of a casual fan. Can you maybe mention some of those? You bet. Um, and they should be really interesting. Skateboarding, um, surfing, uh, climbing, professional climbing, mm -hmm. and uh, pretty astounding. If anyone kind of caught the wave of the climbing craze with Alex Honnold, you know, last year, I don't know if you saw that amazing documentary about him um, ascending um, uh, uh, El Capitan. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but, you know, and that's actually not the kind of climbing we're going to have. It's not going to be, you know, going up El Capitan. You're going to have like really fast climbing up like a climbing wall, the way I understand it. You know, you see that you see at climbing gyms, but it, it introduces a whole nother culture. All of these new sports introduce all these different cultures. There's a culture around each sport, which I find fascinating going to the games. You know, I'll go to, I'll pick a badminton uh, match to go to because I know nothing about it. A lot of Americans don't know, but there are people there who know who all the best players are, which countries compete against each other, which countries really want to beat each other. There's a culture to it. And the same thing with skateboarding, surfing, um, and climbing. One of the funny things that I did mention to you, I went to a USOPC assembly before the pandemic where you got to meet a lot of people and hubbub and talk and, and um, meet uh, representatives from the sports. And I talked to a surfing federation person and she was just telling me about the competition, which I found fascinating because if you were a surfer or no surfers, you know that you got to wait for a wave. You got to wait for good waves, right? So, you know, NBC programming the Olympics, we're going to have the 100 meters here. We're going to have the gymnastics, you know, rhythmic gymnastics here. We're going to have X here. And we're going to have surfing here. But okay, so what if the waves aren't ready to uh, cooperate? So there's a bit of <laughs> right. holding, there's a bit of holding the breath when it comes to surfing, which I think would be, you know, kind of kind of interesting to watch. Um, yeah. And from what I understand, I don't believe they're going to be using wave making machines, although if push comes to shove and, you know, they hit a hit an absolutely placid time during okay. the year, whenever the games are held, they may have to resort to something like that. Right. Well, the other thing I, I think a lot of people enjoy about the Olympics is those other sort of connection stories like uh, remember in uh, the Beijing Beijing Olympics that there was Oregon ryegrass that was seeds that were exported and planted in uh, you know a lot of the the competition fields and of course um, you know Oregon has a long relationship with Japan you know preceding the pandemic we had a non-stop flight on Delta Airlines you know to Tokyo and and the Japanese consulate here and so you know, I think that's the other aspect, like you that we were talking about before, that is a little bit unique as opposed to say, you know, the World Series or, or even the World Cup, in, in, because it, because of the, those connections. So, are there any kind of those human interest or connection stories related to the J to Tokyo Olympics, or is it, or have those been sort of obscured by all this, the the uncertainty? The, they are there. Um, I haven't found them yet because we're still in a time of obscurity. Um, oh, they're they're always there, and and they will be. I just I haven't found them yet. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know. I mean, I think that's what a lot of us are hoping for that we'll be able to get out of this. You know, speculation is still, you know, to have things be returned to normal. But of course, you know, they wouldn't be doing their job if they weren't making sure they could do this safely. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. One would hope. Yeah. Um, so has I mean I know J Japan has had a lot of disaster uh, related experiences and planning related to tsunami and of course the nuclear meltdown, uh, Fukushima and others. I mean, has that been much of a, an issue, or has it mainly just been the overriding pandemic aspect that's been out there? Oh, I think it's the pandemic. I think it's just like everywhere in the world right now. Um, and actually, Japan has done better than a lot of countries, um, mm -hmm. both with cases and um, and with deaths. Um, although they are seeing a surge, uh, you know, right now as as so many other countries are. But I think that's 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 pretty much the main focus right now. And and trying to figure out, you know, you talked about a. Um, about uh, lessons from a bubble or how other leagues have done it. 
um, trying to figure out if if this is at all possible, if you can keep people safe, and if you know, you know how to deal with infection when it inevitably happens, how to deal with uh, people pouring into this place, some having been vaccinated, many not being vaccinated. So um, we we haven't seen the full list at, at this point of health and safety protocols, but you know that it will be um, an enormous one. And um, then again, it comes down like with all these sports, what it's come down to is athletes, officials adhering to protocols. And right. then we get into human behavior, you know. Sure. Not many Olympic athletes go to an Olympics to sit in their hotel room and go out and get takeout food, you know, with a mask, et cetera, and they go back to their hotel room. They go. To, I mean, all the Olympic athletes I've talked to, you know, when their when their events are over, whether they won, lost, placed, whatever, uh, they're just looking forward to yeah. sticking around and having yeah. fun. And right. right now, that you know, if we have a games, I don't think that's going to be possible. Yeah, I mean, I know that was I heard that from through the press uh, about some of the NBA players who were in the bubble in Orlando, you know, which first successfully hosted the MLS's back tournament, and then the NBA bubble, but I've been known for some of the soccer and basketball players that they, you know, it was exhausting mentally uh, to be, you know, isolated from family and not being able to interact. And, uh, you know, for some of them, I think some of them even opted out because of that. Yeah. Which is why the NBA, I mean, that was a big question. Why isn't the NBA going back to a bubble? Because, yeah. you know, they got they got players to buy in for about three months for the people who were there. Actually, it was two teams that lasted the whole th uh, three months who made it to the finals, Miami and the Lakers. Yeah. But um, they figured it, it's just too much to ask um, for an entire five months right. um, to, to, to be in isolation. And right. because, because these athletes were talking about mental health issues as well. Sure. You know, got tough. Look, they have, you know, yes, they're paid millions and millions and millions and they get tested and everything is laid out for them and they're in this you know protective bubble but they're still human beings right so one of our uh longtime members has two really good questions one's a little tougher and one's more fun the you know you referred to some of the poll poll numbers out there and he mentions that uh, if over 80 percent of the japanese public is opposed to this and even if the IOC and, and other like government officials say, well, we can pull that off, is it really feasible to do when you have, you know, that strong a public sentiment against holding such a, a large event? Um, really good question. And, and, and I don't know. I haven't heard of numbers that huge, you know, 80%. Um, I would think that organizers would tap into the 20% who do want it. Yeah and find their volunteers because that's always a big part of every Olympic games are the local volunteers sure. have a lot of spirit and, and they love what they're doing. Um, there is always an, a, 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 an amount of grumbling that goes into every Olympics by the local public because while sure. we see it as a wonderful coming together of the world, Locals look at it as, oh my God, what's going to happen to traffic? And I don't want all these obnoxious foreigners coming to my country. And so, but whether that's gotten to 80%, I haven't, yeah. I haven't ever heard of it being that high. And, and a lot of that is fed um, by the pandemic. Yeah. A really good question, but I just have a feeling, you know, that they won't, now that Japan has paid and overpaid for this whole thing they're not going to let public opinion stop them because okay. they know you know the, who they have to cater to are the people who do want it there and to the thousands and thousands of people who come in as visitors sure sure so the same person has on a more fun note you talked a little bit about like the the joy of you know going to a badminton game and hearing from the the fans there and learning about the sport. I mean, what are some of your other memories uh, of covering the Olympics, especially from the point of view of someone who, I mean, you have a limited amount of time on NPR to talk about these. It's not as a, it's not like Sports Center where you can really like dive into all all the different. What do you, what do you take away and then choose to like highlight when you're when you're reporting out on on NPR? Well, the first thing we do is realize that we are four or five people. Um, and especially when you're covering uh, a summer Olympics, that's absurd to think of that you can cover it all. 
um, you know, NBC is it's it's a state, a city all by itself, you know, and 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 the other rights holders the same way. They just they bring legions yeah. of people, so they can cover everything. So that means we have to pick and choose, and um, and pick and choose wisely. We have to keep an eye on the major events, um, you know, the 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 swimming, the track and field, the gymnastics, which I mentioned. Um, a lot of people like those, but. Also, um, I will, you know, I love finding the really kind of esoteric, um, you know, the pentathlon. I think I covered a pentathlon at one, of, at one uh, Olympics and actually <clears throat> did a story on the day in the pentathlon. That's five events. So I went to each one and just made it a very sound rich piece. And it was, it was really cool. So on the one hand, you, you, you can't cover everything, but in, 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 on the other hand, it's liberating because, sure. okay, we can't cover everything. Let's pick, pick what we want. Right. And boy, that's, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to go, you know, find in my mind the, the 12 Olympics and the moments that have stood out. I know during, I, ha I can remember everything. I'm not <laughs> coming up with them right now because it's just a big jumble. Sure. Um, I think, Actually, I will. Um, maybe it was the 2008 Olympics. And as a final story, I juxtaposed, you know, I mentioned to you, I consider some people true Olympians and others not. That's no knock on the famous and the rich ones. But I juxtaposed um, the men's basketball. In fact, I think I used Kobe Bryant in, in uh, the story juxtaposing his experience and everyone is watching back in the US sure. everyone is seeing it and then i and then i found just randomly found a rower from um i can't even remember what country she was from and she didn't even win a medal i think she won she she finished 5th and so i i did a story kind of juxtaposing those two experiences and obviously i was you know I was kind of <clears throat> waiting it toward her as far as she's the cooler one here. At least this is, you know, the, for athletes like the, the men's basketball team and um, what are the other sports? I, you know, they don't need Olympic games. Sure. I think they, they, they all make a big deal of when they win a gold. Hey, that's great. And congratulations. But it's the ones who don't have the other things to go to. It's the rowers from Romania who don't have a professional rowing league to participate in, who use the Olympics for everything. I find they're much more engaging. So um, I have met and talked to lots of people like that. You can tell I'm stalling here and trying to remember some of them, but I can't. <laughs> That's so, all right. So the no, that was a great story. And the questioner, it's those are the stories I'm always looking for because I, I think those are um, those are what make the Olympics really exciting. Right. So one of our uh, members asks, um, you know, while well, they're hoping that the Olympics takes place, if they don't, does this then give greater promise to some of the world championship events that will be taking place in 2022? For instance the track and field championships, which are going to be at Hayward Field, just like you were talking about. I mean, does that then raise, would that raise in the consciousness, okay, we didn't have the Olympics, then this is, you know, this is, uh, becomes a bigger event because of it. This is the Olympics. I yeah. mean, I, I think that's an outstanding question. And I think, I think it's true. I think we won't know until, yeah. you know, until the Olympics is canceled, but absolutely. If that happens, you know, um, it should be promoted as the Olympics. It should be as important. You know, right. um, athletes will tell you that world championships are just as important. I mean, obviously, Olympics, you, you um, people, um, you're going to be more famous if you do well in Olympics um, and, and potentially be uh, wealthier because of yeah. it, more well known. But, um, you know, just, uh, just within the sport, if you win a world champion, you're, you're good stuff. Sure. So, have you seen one of our audience members ask, you know, Olympians who have used it uh, sort of, or it's become a launching pad for them getting involved in international affairs, international issues. Um, I mean, of course we do have uh, famous athletes like Pele who went on, uh, you know, from the world cup to become like a government minister. But have you seen other uh, athletes that have transitioned, you know, from international competition to say you know, international business or diplomacy or politics? Uh, I was, trying to think it's a fascinating question 
I don't know if any jumped to mind or if that's uh, more of just sort of an overall spirit of, of global connection. I think of two people. Um, Anita de France, the great rower, is now a member of the International Olympic Committee. She was a rower. She was uh, very politically aware. She was very involved in, um, in, in speaking out against the 1980 boycott. I did a story about that last mm. year, kind of comparing the boycott to the postponement of the uh, Tokyo Games. So Anita de France is one I can think of. Another one I can think of, and forgive me because um, I don't know exactly where he is now, but Joey Cheek um, was a speed skater um, at the 2006 Olympics in Turin, Italy. Hmm. And I remember at the time being just blown away by his, he, he won, I can't remember what distance he won, but he, he um, announced at his press conference that he was giving his earnings to, oh, 2006, that's 14 years ago, I can't remember, to some political cause, some country that was in the news um, at that time having some struggles internally, and he was going to donate um, his winnings to that. And I do believe that Joey Cheek has gone on, I'll have to fact check this obviously, yeah. or, the, or the person who asked the question can, but he went on to, I, I'm not sure if it was holding office, but he went on to um, something in life, um, you know, where he was working for the greater good, something right. that politicians should be doing. So, <laughs> um, and I'm sure there are others. I'm just yeah. not coming to mind right now. Right. But one of the other aspects that always intrigues me is when you have players or athletes who are a, a national of one country, but then they have you know, their descendant or have a double, dual nationality and, and they, you know, end up competing for another uh, country. Uh, does that get controversial or does it sort of depend on sort of, the, I guess, the level of, comp, uh, of, uh, of prowess that athlete has? Yeah, um, you know, it has been controversial in the past. I mean, if, if the athlete just is there just you know, completely on a lark. But yeah, you find people who have done that. Um, um, a guy I've been dealing with uh, for the last couple of years, who's a former minor league baseball player, um, who's very involved in, in um, helping minor league baseball players make more money because they don't make barely, they barely make any money at all. But he, he's Jewish and he played for the Israeli national team. And um, he said that was just a complete gas doing that. It was, it was actually, I'm sorry, he, he made the team, but then he was supposed to go to Tokyo. So that's still up in the oh, air yeah. whether, whether he'll go, but you do see people like that. And, um, you know, checking their lineage, you know, where can I, where, where can I, what country can I make it in? Um, and I think the, the, the Olympics, um, um, I think they do have a certain standard, so you can't just be, you know, a complete, sure. a complete amateur. You've got to hit some sorts of standards. But um, yeah, that's always an engaging story when you find yeah. people like that. Well, one article that I saw that was very intriguing, I think, was analyzing countries that invested significant money into basically community sports, so that it was accessible to all having a really incredible payoff then down the road and not necessarily just the Olympics, but things like uh, World Cup and others. And they were highlighting, for instance, Iceland, which has soccer fields available all over, even though it's a tiny volcanic nation. And, and it's, uh, I don't know if you've seen other stories about that. I mean, Norway jumps to mind as a country that clearly has invested, you know, in that and has an incredibly high rate of Olympic success. Yeah, um, well, um, I, I haven't, but I, I can imagine um, maybe uh, China, which right now is investing in a lot of ski programs. So, you know, in about, well, they actually want to see these skiers emerge in a year, but um, <laughs> you may see a whole batch of great Chinese skiers or speed skaters or, uh, or luge uh, athletes uh, appearing in the next generation. Well, you and I had talked about this a little bit before the program, you know, and we grew up back when uh, the, a lot of the Olympics were in the Cold War days, and it was the US and Russia, and then there was always the question of would there be a defection, you know, by an athlete, depending on where the games were held. I mean, has some of those things now post Cold War gone by the wayside, or do you still feel kind of some of those tensions between, uh, you know, uh, rivals outside the sporting world. Do you feel that when you're at an Olympics? Yeah, um, but I, I would say maybe not tension, 
but you feel a healthy competition that, you know, when, um, you know, whatever the, 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 the national rivals are, um, you'll see the fans cheer a little bit stronger and, and depending on how much they've been drinking, um, getting, getting uh, a little exorcised about what's happening um, on the field of play. Uh, you, you do see it. And uh, I remember um, the, the fall of the, uh, of the Soviet Union when the wall came down, that was the late 80s, right? Or um, I'm just trying to remember what Olympics it was where we, uh, you know, the first in the so-called post-Cold War era, um, but, you know, so that ended kind of the hostilities, yeah. but, um, you know, the competitiveness and the, and, and the fact that countries um, really want to beat another country in particular, that never ends. And I think that's one of the fun parts of the Olympics. I mean, that's, sure. you know, um, the IOC always says we're a big family. The world's coming together. We don't believe in, you know, country versus country. But that's the whole fun of it is to right. really, really get into it. It's I think I was saying to you and Tim, it's like it's like war without the bloodshed. So, you know, and, and I think a lot of people who um, go to the games, um, you know, that's the that's the that's the energy that they bring. Sure. Well, mm -hmm. and following along that uh, someone, uh, one of our members posted in the chat that uh, the gentleman you, you mentioned, uh, Joey Cheek, uh, co-founded Team Darfur. Uh, yeah, working on, yeah. on the, the crisis in, in, in Sudan. So, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. really good point about that. Um, one of our uh, other members asked about the whole uh, controversy with Russian doping and the sort of swinging back and forth on the level of severity of penalties and who's excluded or not. I mean, what's the latest state of play on that? The latest state of play is that Russia appears to have gotten away with it. Again, um, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, the highest court sport in the world, uh, recently ruled that um, that Russia will be uh, banned for two years, and I, I say banned in big quotation marks, mm -hmm. um, rather than four. The World Anti-Doping Agency was was promoting four. Um, but so, so the Court of Arbitration for Sport, we call it CAS um, for short, um, it, it was an interesting uh, ruling they made. They, they made a ruling that said that um, there, there was definitely cheating by the, by the Russians, um, you know, going back to um, when the Olympics were, were in Russia in 2014 and, and even before. Um, there was cheating upon cheating and cover up upon cover up. Um, but that said, and, and they released like 186 page document, I believe, this week or the last week, kind of detailing what happened. That said, they reduced um, the proposed penalty to, um, to two years and not much of a penalty. We're going to see the same farce of Russian athletes being able to compete, uh, supposedly neutral. Their anthem won't be able to play, but they're even going to be able to have Russia on their jerseys, uh, mm. I, I believe. And um, you know, it, it's it's how you line up on the doping issue. It's uh, yeah. I think I've I've gone through different kind of phases because I've covered it for thirty years, and um, you know, if you if you're gonna punish, you punish. And I, I think one of Cass's, I, I know that one of Cass's reasons for not punishing the Russians more is that they're saying that they're saying we're punishing a generation that really wasn't involved in mm -hmm. in the cheating that that we're you know that we're sanctioning here. So the newer generation, well, do we believe that? I don't know, you mm -hmm. know. So that's a long way of saying it's still a mess that yeah. as long as the Russians do get to go to the Olympics um, in in one form or another, that there will be a sense that we got away with it. And yeah. I can tell you the whole kind of, we're not gonna play the Russian anthem, we're not gonna fly the Russian flag. I was there in Pyeongchang in Korea uh, for the gold medal game when the Russians won. And this amazing scene when they were trying to play the Olympic hymn, you know, because they're supposed to play the Olympic anthem right. instead of the Russian anthem. And all of the Russian hockey players were, and the fans were bellowing out the Russian national anthem and drowning out the Olympic theme. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, oh. 
it's it's a mess. I don't think it's uh, I don't think the world has ever gotten doping under control. I think we've moved on in large part uh, because I think you know people think it's an unwinnable war in a sense. And yeah. but you know, and I think that's going to allow people to continue to cheat um, on the level that Russia's doing it. I don't know. That's you know that's still fairly rare when you have a whole systemic sure. national program to do it, but. Um, it goes on, and yeah. um, they'll be there in uh, if 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 not if there's no Tokyo Olympics, they'll be there in Beijing. Well, a related question from a from a different member is uh, Alberto Salazar's appeal comes up, I think, in March, related to uh, doping. Is that something you're tracking as well, or is again is this one of the ones that sort of has faded a little bit? I haven't heard much about it lately. I covered it at the time, but um, I haven't covered it recently, so I'd be hesitant to kind of speak on that. Okay. Right. Yeah, sure. So uh, kind of a fun, I mean, we're almost running out of time, but a couple of sort of inside baseball questions. I mean, how, how does it work as a, as a correspondent? I mean, are, does, does NPR, NPR have a fixture who, who takes care of all your logistics and passes and everything? Or are you, uh, do you does IOC, you know, how, how, what's it like to be a reporter at a huge event like this? You're, you're looking at the fixer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry. What was the last part of it, Derek? What's well, it just, like? Uh, you know, I guess that's it. I mean, is if you're are, are, are the reporters sort of you know doing all that, or is there some kind of operation within either the IOC or or the the host authorities, or who, who wrangles all that and figures out like how do you get out to the you know canoeing venue? Right. Know? Well, there, you know, there's transportation. They, they, I mean, they make it possible for all the the journalists. They make life somewhat easier uh, in past Olympics you've had a, a lane on these new highways that they build you know for journalists I mean at least ah. we're not just for journalists but no. we are part of the select few yeah, who can sure. use that super fast lane because we got to get to where we're going mm -hmm. um, there are limitations on what we can do I mean forever um, you know it, unless NPR wants to pony up hundreds of millions of dollars we will forever be a non rights holder mm -hmm. um, meaning that we are limited in um, where we can go, well, not so much where we can go, but what we, what we're able to do. Um, right. For instance, um, you know, um, we, we can't record in certain venues. Um, we can't, uh, you know, talk to athletes in certain venues. So um, there, there are strict limits as far as, as that goes. Um, we've been able to work around them and, and get our jobs done for the most sure. part. And um, so it's just a very busy time, but it's it's an amazing time. I mean, I just it's it's a 17 day adrenaline rush, and um, and and the wonderful thing about an event like that is, I always said it's like point your mic. It's it's just you don't have to go dig up stories. You point your mic, and you've got an amazing story. Right. You can just you can run into someone, and oh my God, you're an amazing story. I'm going to do a story on you, sure. or find an athlete you never heard of. And, um, and every day there is a new drama. It's like, you can have meetings about, okay, here's what we're gonna cover. Here's what we're gonna try and do. This is what this show wants. And this is what that show wants. But you also always have to be ready to drop everything, um, whether it's for an amazing athletic event or in a huge doping penalty or something political that happened. Um, I should add that that will be an interesting part of Olympics going forward, Tokyo being potentially the first one as far as um, expressions against social injustice, social and racial injustice, which has been sweeping certainly the sports world, but the entire world. And um, I, I do, I do want to give a shout out to the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee because um, last month it basically said we will not punish people for um, going against uh, Rule 50, which is part of the Olympic Charter, which says you may not demonstrate um, during an Olympic Games. And so if someone wants to kneel, if someone wants to raise a fist or make an expression or wear a t-shirt that says something, the US OPC has said it will not punish these people and, you know, and, and, and sees the, the merit in, um, in those expressions in this day and age. Well, I mean, that's great to hear. And it's, it has been particularly moving, I think, to see in, in many of the different American tournaments to see the Black Lives Matter t-shirts and the moments of silence, you know, at halftime uh, or at the pregame. Uh, so that's striking to hear that they're going to take that approach for the U.S. Olympic Committee. 
Yeah, and I would hope other countries do because there are a lot of bad things happening around the world that we don't hear right. about. And if you get an athlete, you know, this is what our National Olympic Committee did. I don't know what other Olympic committees are going to do. Yeah. Hopefully the International Olympic Committee will normalize this in its rules, maybe change Rule 50. So any country that wants to express itself, any athlete from any country sure. can do so without risking some sanction. So last question to close out, uh, Tim ask, you know, do you have a, is there a, a like a visual moment that's here in your mind? He thinks of, you know, the older Muhammad Ali lighting the torch. Uh, you know, what jumps out in my mind is the incredible like Archer lighting the torch in, in Barcelona. I mean, the, these sort of things that, that stick with people over the years, is there kind of some kind of image or visual that, that, that makes you think of the Olympics? Um, I think being fortunate enough to see, um, to having seen all nine of Usain Bolt's gold medal um, competitions really? and, and just being able to having seen him and maybe the first, maybe the hundred meters when he won the hundred meters in, um, well, shoot, where would that have been? Beijing, I guess the first, plot, the, the first batch of medals. Um, where he spread his arms wide, uh, you know, at about the 70 meter mark, and he would have obliterated the world record by even more had he not just kind of done that. But I think that represent that's a that's a moment that um, I I will always remember. Um, yeah, a, f a phenomenal athlete, and to have that kind of uh, longevity uh, in a sport like that is incredible. So I'll think of that. I'm sure yeah. others will come to me. Maybe we should have another Zoom call about this. But actually, I'm surprised what, what Tim said, because I thought maybe we wanted to end by talking about how the Blazers are going to survive not having Nurkic or CJ uh, for the next month or two. I was going to say something about that. The only thing I was texting my friends today that, that gave me sauce was that the Timbers managed to sign Felipe Mora, their Chilean uh, striker to a long-term deal because yes it has been a rough week for Blazers fans. Hard not to think we were born under a dark star but you know um, it goes on and on and um, well it's only knock on wood a month for CJ and yeah. uh, because he was sure making Damian Lillard's life easier so but yeah. that's for another Zoom call. Right? <laughs> so. Well we'll take you up on that and Tom we so appreciate your uh, generosity time it's been a real honor to me I feel like uh, you know, I've been able to play the role that's usually played by the uh, weekend edition uh, host. Scott and, Simon, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much. Uh, and members, thank you for your unswavering support during what has been a very challenging time for all of us. And, and you know, with, uh, you know, nonprofit like World Oregon not being able to hold events in person, we so appreciate your stalwart support, your fantastic questions. I urge you to, uh, you know, tune in and support OPB uh, to hear more of Tom's uh, fantastic reporting. And Tom, we'll look forward to connecting with you on another program in the future. Derek, it's been an absolute pleasure. I want to thank you. And I want to make a, a naked request here for story ideas. That's where the best story ideas come from, other people, people in the world. And so if you have any, you can let Derek know, you can let me know. And uh, but, but thank you. It, it was an honor. And it's always fun to talk about the Olympics. And let's hope we have one in six months. Great. Well, thanks so much, Tom. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe, and we'll see you at our next webinar. Bye-bye.